Hi everyone, this week we are going to talk about um, Monopoly. So following last week's lecture, um, I made a review of competitive markets. I talked about the uh, competitive equilibrium. I talked about Pareto efficiency and the fact that um, preferred competition leads to Pareto efficient allocations. I mentioned that preferred competition is one of the conditions that are required. This week, we are going to violate the first assumption, the first condition of preferred competition, which is that firms have no market power. This week, we are going to assume that a market is being supplied by only one firm. So this firm, the monopolist, is going to be um, in a position of market power. And so we are going to see how um, the uh, market equilibrium outcome is going to turn out. First, I want to mention this disclaimer. I do not allow this content to be published without my consent. If I find this content published online on other platforms, I will take this content down and I will report the name or the pseudonym or the, of the person who reported this content. You're free to use it for your own personal use, but I do not allow it to appear anywhere else than on this canvas page. So a firm is called a monopolist or is in a monopoly if it is the only firm in the market. No other firm produces the same good or a close substitute for it. The close substitute part is very important. Most firms in real life produce their own goods and no other firm produces exactly the same good. Think about Coca-Cola, for instance. They make their cola, but their cola is unique. It has a unique label, a unique color, a unique composition. The shape of the bottle is different. The name of the brand is different and so on. However, they are very close competitors to Coca-Cola. If you think about Pepsi Cola, they make a cola which tastes relatively similar for many people, at least for me, but the color is different, the label is different, the ingredients are different, the shape of the bottle is different, and so on. The goods are not exactly the same, but they are very close substitute for each other. So I will not talk about Coca-Cola as being a pure monopolist in this sense. Coca-Cola is the leader on this market, so the, it's close to be a monopolist, but Pepsi-Cola is definitely a, um, a force to be reckoned with in this market. The degree to which goods are substitutes is measured by the cross price elasticity of demand, which is the percentage change in demand for a good due to a 1% increase in the price of a competing good. So imagine that the price of Pepsi-Cola increases by 1%. The cross price elasticity of demand for Coca-Cola would be the percentage change in the demand for Coca-Cola products when the price of Pepsi-Cola products increases by 1%. In a case like this, chances are that the demand for Coca-Cola will increase if the price of Pepsi-Cola is too high. So in this sense, we cannot really call Pepsi-Cola and Coca-Cola a pure monopoly. Rather, we talk about monopolistic competition, which is outside of the scope of this course. There are only a few pure monopolies. A monopoly in general, and this is what we are going to assume here, faces a downward sloping demand. So, if the monopoly charges a higher price, the demand is going to decrease. Consumers are going to buy a lower quantity and vice versa. The idea with a monopoly, with a monopolist, is that if the monopolist raises the price above the marginal cost, it will not lose all its demand. It is a very important aspect of, um, of a monopoly as opposed to perfect competition. Because it can rise the price above the marginal cost, 
we say that a monopolist has market power. The definition is market power is the ability to charge a price above the marginal cost. If you remember perfect competition, perfect competition is a case where price equals marginal cost. And it is a case where firms have no market power. So we tied the definition of market power to the ability of charging a price above the marginal cost. Where do monopolies come from? In the sense as how, um, how does a firm end up being a monopolist nowadays? First of all, it can be due to government policy. The government could allow a firm to operate as a monopolist for different reasons, but sometimes the government can own the monopoly or at least regulate it, especially for the case of utilities like gas, uh, electricity and water. Sometimes the government allows a firm to operate as a monopolist because the firm purchases a patent from the government. A patent is the right to um, supply a good to be the exclusive producer of a good for a certain amount of time. In particular, in the market for drugs, so I'm thinking about vaccines, new sorts of medication. Pharmaceutical companies, once they come up with a new drug, pay a certain price to the government to be allowed to be the only producer of the good or of anything similar. They want to avoid being imitated by other companies and they want to avoid facing competitions, in particular due to the cost of investing in research and development to find that new drug. This also works with copyrights. Movie studio and music studio, music studios, once they come up with a new movie or a music album, buy the right to be the exclusive distributor of their own movie or music. It is the case for trademarks as well. Some firms register the name of their, um, of their brand to the government so that they become the only producer of their good. Sometimes the government also um, gives exclusive licenses to some, um, in some industries like nightclubs or cable subscriptions and so on. Sometimes monopolies can arise as a consequence of the characteristics of a specific industry or market. And sometimes some markets are characterized by large efficient scales. This is a case where firms are constantly in a situation of economies of scale. Economies of scale is a situation where the average cost of production decreases as the quantity produced increases. In general, young firms experience economies of scale. When they start a business, they as they increase their uh, production scale, it becomes less and less costly to produce, to produce each extra unit of the good. For instance, if you have a brand new warehouse or brand new factory and you're producing a certain amount of goods, increasing the scale will result in a decrease in the per unit cost because you might already have a facility which is big enough to accommodate for the extra units. In general, firms eventually, as they grow, reach a peak beyond which increasing, um, increasing the quantity produced will also increase the per unit costs. This usually happens when a factory is operating at full capacity. There are plenty of employees which are working in this very specific way to not get in each other's way the machines, containers, and so on are being used at full capacity. So if the firm wants to produce more, it has to either hire more workers, but that might harm productivity because eventually there might be too many people in the room, 
or they might have to invest in additional equipment, which will res result in huge fixed costs. Some situations, some industries like the gas industry, the electricity industry, are, character are characterized by constant economies of scale. Electricity in particular, it costs a lot of money to build, operate and maintain an electricity network with electricity tower running all across British Columbia, all the way to the Northwest Territories, for instance. But adding one extra user on the current network is almost costless to a firm. So the more users there are, since, since the cost of maintaining the network is fixed, the more users of the network there are, the cheaper it is to provide electricity per user. We also see this in the uh, transportation industry. Think about the railroads. It is very costly to create, build, operate and maintain a um, railroad network across Canada, which is the second biggest country in the world. So having two companies with their own railroad network is probably not sustainable because they would have to compete with each other while having to pay those huge costs. This is why in those markets, it is more efficient to have one firm produce for the whole market rather than having two or more firms producing lower quantities. It is simply less costly to have one firm produce a lot. So in this case, the government will allow firms to, um, to be in, a, in, the, in the situation of a monopoly, but of course they will um, operate some regulation. Other markets are characterized by what we call network externalities, in particular on the demand side. I will go over externalities in two weeks. The idea of a network externality or network effect is that as there are more and more users of a given good or service, it becomes more and more interesting for non-users to get on board as well. And here I have three examples. Microsoft Office or more generally software are a case where if there are already many users of the software, it gives incentives to non-users to get on board and start using the software as well because of the big community of users, in particular for collaborative work. Once you start working for a company, the company might require you to use a specific software. It could be for, um, instead of Zoom, it could be like Cisco or Microsoft Teams, or it could be Microsoft Office over other softwares, or it could be Tableau, or it could be other statistical software. The idea is that they will require you to use this software because probably people in your team are already using that software. Think about trading cards at recess in, uh, in elementary school. I'm a big fan of Dragon Ball myself. Um, think about trading cards, but think about Pokemon trading cards and any, type of, um, any other type of trading cards. If there is only one kid in the school who has trading cards, other kids don't really have an incentive to buy their own cards and start trading with him. If, however, almost all of your friends or almost all the kids in your cohort already have trading cards, you have an incentive to get trading, get trading cards yourself and start playing and trading with them. So the more users they are, the more interesting it is for non-users. And since I talk about network, of course, you can imagine that social media will also be um, be a case of network externalities. If there are many Twitter users already, it is more interesting for non-users to get a Twitter account. Think about Facebook. Not a long time ago, I, I am not on Facebook, but not a long time ago, my friends who were all on Facebook 
used to organize events on Facebook. And if they uh, forgot that I was not on Facebook, then I would not see the invitation in time or I would have to, I would just hear it from friends talking about it at school. And eventually I would say, oh, what are you, what are you guys doing? And I said, you know the where that there is a party on Saturday? Like, no, like nobody told me anything. It's like, oh, it's on Facebook. Yeah, I'm not on Facebook. That time, it gave me an incentive to get on Facebook, and I actually didn't. <laughs> Twitter, same thing. The bigger the feed, the more interesting it is to join the platform. Think about YouTube. Think about TikTok and Instagram. Those are three platforms that deliver video content in different formats. But remember that not a long time ago, those platforms were um, competing with other platforms. 15 years ago, YouTube was competing with another, um, other um, video platforms like Google Video. I don't know if that still exists, but Google Video was pretty big back then. There was a French platform called Dailymotion that still exists, but the quality of videos is pretty poor and it's not really used anymore. YouTube got a head start by improving the features over time, the quality of the videos they can upload, probably the monetization schemes for people who, you know, who post video on a regular basis and so on. It increased the traffic on YouTube so that now whenever you're thinking about watching it, something like watching a video online, you're probably going to think about YouTube first, unless it's uh, app specific like uh, Instagram or, um, or TikTok. So, the more popular those platforms are, the more, the even more popular they can get, if you see what I mean. Now, YouTube is pretty much a monopoly, is pretty much in a monopoly on, um, on the video market. Sometimes monopolies can arise as a consequence of firm's actions on the market. Some firms can control essential inputs, so they can have a control over what is needed to produce. The Beers is a very big um, company, big corporation in the diamond industry. At the end of the uh, 1990s or 1980s, they used to own around 80% of the diamond resources on the world, of the world. So if you were buying diamonds back then, chances are that the diamonds were coming from the beers. Since the industry has been open to competition, so that now the beers only owns, I believe, 30% of the uh, diamond resources, but the beers is still very influential at the retail level. Those companies in general get access to a diamond mine, extract the diamond, and either sell the unpolished diamond to retailers or jewelries who are going to polish and make jewels, or they polish the diamond and resell the polished product. Although the beers is not as influential as it used to be, it is still highly influential. Influential enough so that it can have an impact on the diamond world price through its actions. In other cases, Firms are simply more cost efficient. By being more cost efficient than other firms, they can adopt a predatory behavior by charging very low prices. By doing so, they might be able to drive less efficient firms out of the market. In particular, firms which are well established, who have been on a market for a long time, think about Walmart, think about Microsoft, those are big firms that have been operating since Microsoft since the 70s or 80s and Walmart, I'm not sure, but maybe even older than this. Those firms have experienced um, the market for a long time and so they have been able to cut costs as much as possible. So that if there is a new entrant in the industry who maybe wants to make profits, those firms can adopt a predatory behavior, charge very low prices, knowing that those new firms cannot compete because their costs are still pretty high. Doing so, those well-established firms hope they can 
uh, drive those other firms out of the market and remain um, a monopolist or close to a monopolist. Now, let's get into the model. I don't want to explain the mathematics behind the model and behind this result because this course is not made for that. This is something that you might have studied in Econ 201 or that you will study in Econ 302. A monopolist, like any other firm, wants to maximize its profits. So, after writing down the profit function, the firm is going to take the first order conditions. The first order condition is you take the derivative of the profit function and you set it to zero. This corresponds to the peak of the profit function. If you play around with the math, it turns out that you end up with the following condition. This is called the inverse elasticity rule. The left hand side is called the learner index. It is a price cost margin. Note that on the top of this ratio, you can find price minus marginal cost. This is a measure of market power. Market power is the ability to charge a price above the marginal cost. This difference is divided by the price itself so that the left hand side is actually a percentage. It is a relative price cost margin. Absolute would be in dollar terms, just P minus MC. That's how much money I make be after paying for all the costs. But dividing by the price, it becomes a percentage of the price. So the left hand side, the learner index, is the percentage of the price that is going to go in the form of profits to the monopolist. To give you an example, imagine I sell shoes. I make and sell shoes. I sell my pair of shoes. I have one pair of shoes I want to sell and I sell it for $30. That pair of shoes cost me $20 to produce between buying the leather, the equipment, sewing machines, maybe hiring somebody else to saw the shoes or maybe making them myself, but it takes hours of work. The left hand side of the inverse elasticity rule then becomes 30 minus 20 divided by 30. This is equal to 10 over 30 or 1 over 3 or 33.333%. This means that one third of the price or 33.33% of the price of the shoes is going to go directly to my pocket in the form of profit. The remaining 66.66% will be used to pay the costs. Pay the employees or pay myself, if I am employing myself, paying for the leather, paying for the laces, paying for the machines, and so on. Now, let's look at the right-hand side. The right-hand side is 1 over minus epsilon p. Epsilon p is defined as the price elasticity of demand. So, it is defined as the percentage change in the demand when the price increases by 1%. Usually this number is negative. If the price increases, consumers are going to purchase less. So if you look at the right hand side here, since epsilon is negative, putting a minus in front is going to cancel the negative and so the right hand side will be positive. And it makes sense. After all, if this right hand side has to be equal to the left hand side, then the left hand side needs to be positive as well which makes sense because we need that price be above the marginal cost. If the price is below the marginal cost, the firm is making a loss. Now, this rule is very important. 
it tells that for a monopolist, when the monopolist maximizes its profits, this rule is satisfied. Here, QM is the quantity, the optimal quantity a monopolist should sell. So it means that at the maximum profit, the relative markup or the left hand side will depend on how elastic the demand is. If the demand is very elastic, so if epsilon is high, but when I say high, I mean high in magnitude. We don't care about the minus. So if epsilon p is bigger than one in magnitude or lower than minus one, it means that if the monopolist increases the price by 1%, the demand is going to decrease by more than 1%. Sharp decrease. What happens in this case? Well, it means that the right hand side is 1 over a big number. So 1 over a big number produces a small number. So it means that the left hand side needs to be small as well. So it, needs, it means that the price will not be way above the marginal cost. In fact, it means the price will be pretty close to the marginal cost at the optimum. So if the demand is very elastic, the monopolist will not be able to charge a very high price. So it will be limited by the demand because if the demand is too elastic, a price which is too high results in a quantity sold which is too low. On the other hand, if the market is rather inelastic, if the demand is inelastic, then epsilon here is a small number between minus 1 and 0, or in magnitude between 0 and 1, which means that if the price increases by 1%, then the uh, demand will decrease by less than 1%. So if the price increases, the demand will not decrease by a lot. This rule is then saying that if the demand is inelastic, so epsilon p is small, 1 over small produces big, and the left-hand side is big. So the price will be way above the marginal cost. When the demand is inelastic, the monopolist has more market power because it can afford to charge a higher price without losing too many customers. It's a very, very powerful insight and you need to know this rule by heart for, um, for the midterm exam and the final exam. So the monopolist always charges a higher price than in perfect competition, and it will sell a lower quantity. We're going to see this in a graph in two slides. If the demand is inelastic, then the monopolist can charge a high price, and so the monopolist has a high market power. If the demand is, inel if the demand is elastic, then the right-hand side is small, and the, the monopolist has a pretty small market power. This means that even if the firm is a monopolist, so even if, the, even if it's the only firm to produce on the market, it cannot choose whatever price it wants because it's, it, it is limited, it is disciplined by the demand. Think about Apple. If Apple charges $1 billion for an iPhone, somebody might pay $1 billion for an iPhone. There could be a Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos out there who will be willing to do it. But chances are that there will be only one or two iPhones being sold at this price. So the profit will be, the sales at least, will be something like one or two billion dollars. Instead, Apple could sell an iPhone for $500 or $1,000 and sell 500 millions of them. Profits will be way higher. Note, by the way, that the price of iPhones tends to, be more, uh, tends to be higher than the price of phones running on Android. 
One of the reasons is the demand for iPhones is less elastic than the demand for Android phones. There are several reasons. The first reason is iPhone is the only uh, an, an, an iPhone is the only phone that has the um, the Apple operating system inside. So if somebody likes Apple's operating system because they're used to it, because they're sync with their Mac and their iPod, and because of the way the apps um, work and so on, then they will need to get an iPhone if they want to get um, an Apple um, operating system. For Android, there are plenty of brands that produce that run on the exact same operating system. So then it becomes a matter of what hardware is the best. But I can use Android the same way on a Samsung phone than on a Nokia phone. And this is one of the reasons you will see um, Android phones being sold for a lower price than iPhones. The cost of making a phone in itself should be relatively the same between iPhones and Samsung and Huawei and so on. Yet, Samsung, well, maybe not Samsung, but Huawei, Xiaomi and other brands sell their phones for a lower price. Here are some um, estimates of price elasticity of demand. So um, a researcher from Harvard around, I believe, 2014, 2015, I think this is uh, how old this um, study is, estimated different price elasticity of demand for different goods. So note that all of those numbers in principle should have a minus in front of them because it's a price elasticity of demand. It's negative. However, since we know it, the author omitted all of the minuses. I want to draw your attention on a uh, couple of them. Let's look at the first three entries. Salt, matches, and toothpicks. Those goods have a relatively inelastic demand. If the price increases by 1%, the demand for those goods is going to decrease by 0.1%. It's very low. It's barely any decrease. I see personally two different reasons why. The first one is salt, maybe matches and toothpicks as well, can be seen as necessity goods. Maybe not matches and toothpicks, but definitely salt. Everybody uses salt in their cooking in uh, everyday life. So, if the price increases, since people keep using salt, chances are demand is not going to decrease a lot. Now, for salt matches and toothpicks, I see another narrative of why the demand is inelastic. I would say it's because those goods are already pretty cheap. You can find those, those three goods at the dollar store for $1.25. In fact, I believe you can buy uh, something like 1,000 matches at the dollar store. Or maybe I bought them at another store, but I bought them for $3, 1,000 matches. You can find a box of 50 toothpicks, or maybe 100, probably 50, at the dollar store as well for $1.25. So if you increase the price of these goods by 1%, they go from $1.25 to $1.26 ish or $1.27. That is not a big difference in the price. So I don't see why a consumer would suddenly stop buying salt, matches or toothpicks. Goods which are more expensive tend to have a more elastic demand because if you increase the price by 1% of something that already costs $500, you are increasing its price by $5. Here, for salt, matches, and toothpicks, we are increasing the price by only one cent. I also want to draw your attention to the next two uh, items, gasoline short run and gasoline long run. Why do you think price elasticity of demand is lower in the short run than the long run? So why do you think demand for gasoline in the short run is more inelastic than in the long run. A 
If you guys have any idea, feel free to use the chat. Well, people who consume gasoline have usually a pretty scheduled routine. They use the car to pick up the kids uh, at school and drop them off, or kindergarten, or daycare. They use the car to go to work, for instance. So, if today or tomorrow they learn that the price of gasoline is going to increase by 1%, they won't be able to adjust their lifestyle right away. If they have the habit of using the car for all those things, chances are that within a couple of weeks, they will not change their consumption of gasoline. But if this price increase is uh, durable, more permanent, somebody in the chat said it, exactly. In the future, if you know that the price of gasoline is bound to increase, or is permanently increasing, then you might be able to see it coming and you might plan for the future. You might change your transportation mode. You might switch your car, you might change cars. You buy an electric car. You can buy a hybrid car, which consumes less gasoline. You might buy a car that works, uh, that rolls on gas. You could um, use public transportation more. You might start taking the bus more. You might start taking your bike more and so on. But those are long run adjustments that in the short run, it might not be able to make at least within a couple of weeks or a month. Maybe after three months, after realizing that gasoline is going to stay that expensive, then you might um, decide to change your transportation habits. A couple more. Coffee, for instance, has a pretty low elasticity of demand as well, 0.25%. Coffee is the kind of good that people need to go with their day, to go on with their day. Some people cannot function without coffee in the morning. And second, coffee is a rather addictive good. Caffeine is addictive. So chances are that um, alcohol and tobacco also have a rather low elasticity of demand. In fact, tobacco is right below here. And in the short run, it's 0.45%, which is rather low. Ela a demand is considered elastic if it's beyond 1%. If it's lower than 1%, it's considered rather inelastic. Physician services has a pretty low elasticity of demand as well. Well, it's your health. When you gotta go, you gotta go. If it's more expensive, well, there are no other alternative. Another one which is interesting is automobiles, long run, which is 0.2, versus short run, which is 0.2 to 0.5, 1.2 to 1.5. It's kind of the reverse um, to gasoline but there is a um, coherent narrative behind it. In the short run, if you want to change your car, you're going to be way more sensitive to the price. In the long run, this is something you can plan, and so you might have a more inelastic demand because you might choose your vehicle more carefully. In the short run, you might decide to just switch temporarily to um, a bike. So you might not decide to change your car, but rather you might decide to change your transportation mode while still having your car. Interestingly, um, Chevrolet automobiles have a very high elasticity of demand as well as fresh tomatoes. Why is it that high? Chances are it's because they're substitutes. Chevrolet is not the only car company in the world. You have Ford, BMW, you have the French brands, you have the Japanese brands, the Korean brands, and so on. Same with tomatoes. If tomatoes get too expensive, then consumers are going to switch to cucumbers, zucchini, and so on. Last one I want to talk about is the price elasticity of demand for movies, 0.9. I think that if this study was reconducted today, the price elasticity of demand for movies would be way higher. In fact, it would probably be beyond one or two percent. Two reasons. First reason, pandemic. Not everybody is willing to sit in a room with other people for two hours, given the current circumstances. 
And the second is, there has been a bloom in video on demand services, Netflix, Crave, HBO, Amazon Prime, and so on, coupled with an increase in the quality of sound and video systems at home. Now, watching a movie at home has become pretty close to being a good substitute to a movie at a movie theater for those who have a good big setup. So chances are that elasticity of demand for movies is now way, not way, but even higher than it was a couple of years ago. So how does it look on a graph? The left graph shows the perfect competition equilibrium. It's pretty much the same graph as the one I showed last week. Price is equal to marginal cost. So P star and Q star are the price and quantities that will prevail on that market. Given that price and quantity, the blue triangle will be the consumer surplus. The red triangle will be the producer surplus. Total surplus is maximized. The outcome is Pareto efficient. First, welfare theorem. The right graph shows the outcome under a monopoly. A consequence of the math I, sh I, I talked about before is that the quantity QM, the monopolist quantity, will be chosen such that the marginal revenue is equal to the marginal cost. So where they meet, which is this point, is the point where the monopoly quantity will be decided. Given this quantity, plug this in the demand, you obtain the price, and PMQM will be the uh, price and quantity that prevail in, um, in a monopoly. Note that PM is bigger than P star. The monopolist will charge a higher price because the price is higher, automatically the quantity sold will be lower. Consumer surplus are worse off than before. Their consumer surplus is now this smaller triangle. But the monopolist, the producer, is enjoying a higher surplus or profit than before. If you add up those two surpluses and look at the difference between this total surplus and this total surplus, you can see that the difference is equal to this green triangle. This green triangle is a surplus that used to go to either consumers or producers, but now don't go to anybody. So we call this a deadweight loss. In fact, it's a deadweight loss also because the units between QM and Q star are units for which the willingness to pay of consumers is higher than the willingness to sell of producers. So technically, we could make consumers better off and producers better off if producers could sell those units at those smaller prices. But since there is only one price on the market, the monopolist doesn't want to lower the price and increase its quantities because it would lower its profits. Rather, the monopolist prefers to keep the price at PM and even if it means selling a lower quantity, it maximizes its profits. Because inside the green triangle, we could make consumers better off and producers better off at the same time, but this is not happening, then we can see that the monopoly outcome is not Pareto efficient. So monopolies are not great. Consumers have a rather low surplus. The price is very high. The quantity is pretty low. So in general, governments do not like monopolies. I say in general because I talked about the exceptions at the beginning of the lecture. What can or should a government do when it comes to uh, dealing with a monopoly. First thing it could do is divest crucial inputs. I talked about railroads before. Imagine that the railroad belongs to the government and train companies can rent 
the use of this network, but they're not in charge of maintaining it. This way, you could see two trains from different companies at the train station. They pay a, a rent to the government so that the government can um, the government can maintain the railroad in a good state and at the same time this market will be more competitive because there will be more than one train company. It is the same with national airlines with airports. Airports have slots for all kinds of companies but the airport itself is not maintained by the national airlines companies. It is maintained by the airport, which is in part, partly or fully owned by the government. More generally, the government can try to encourage competition one way or another. So it can give favorable treatment in wireless spectrum auctions for new competitors. It can welcome new competitors and give them the right to access resources that the incumbents, the current firms, have access to. Wireless spectrum waves are waves in the air that are used to pick up for your phone to pick up signal, to pick up service. In some areas, if you go into, uh, if you go in, uh, if you go to rural British Columbia, in some areas you might have service with Kudo, but not with Fido. The government can allow multiple firms to use the same waves, so that there is an increase in competition. Or it can simply regulate uh, the monopoly through price and quantity regulation. It could require certain services, it could fix a price ceiling so that the monopolist cannot charge a price beyond a certain threshold, or it could tax the monopolist. There are other considerations of granting monopolies. First of all, I talked about natural monopolies. They should exist because it is simply more efficient. But they should be regulated to make sure the monopolist doesn't rip consumers off with high prices. The government can, for instance, set price caps, which is a price ceiling, or can operate some sort of cost plus regulation. It can estimate the costs of the monopolist, then take into account a certain profit the monopolist is allowed to make and choose the price the monopolist should charge on the market so that the monopolist makes that particular profit. In reality, those solutions come with caveats, with drawbacks, so there is no one best way to regulate a monopoly. The government can also generate revenue through selling the right to form a monopoly. I mentioned wireless spectrum, which usually are those rights are given through auctions. Toll highways, patents is a way to make money for the government. In general, I talked about it before, but one reason also to have monopolies is to encourage innovation. Research and development is a very risky process. It requires huge investments that might not give any return. You might have to pay uh, for, you might have to hire scientists, engineers, and so on for years. You might have to invest in a lot of equipment for years. And maybe at the end of the day, they might not come up with an innovation which is good enough for you to get an edge on the market. So firms might not have an incentive to, in, to, to invest in research and development because the innovation process, or at, at least its return, is risky. So the government can step up and say, if you come up with a new product, a new innovation that you are the only one uh, to produce, we can grant you, we can allow you to be the exclusive producer of that good for a certain amount of time. So, the government can allow them to be a monopolist. In this case, they, the, the, the monopolist would be allowed, legally allowed, to sue any company that produces something which is too close to their product. Of course, a case would have to be made. 
but there was such a case recently between Samsung and Apple, where Samsung, I believe, imitated or copied or produced something very similar to an Apple product, but the Apple product was subject to a patent. Same with copyrights. If you want to give incentives to studios to invest massive, amount of, massive amounts of money into movie making and music making, then you need to guarantee that they will be the only distributor of their own product once the product is released. I want to quickly finish this lecture with, um, with a type of market we encounter in reality way more than monopolies, an oligopoly. Mono means one, oligo means several. Mini markets are characterized by uh, several firms. Not many, many firms, not one, but something in the middle. Something from two to 10 firms, for instance, or two to 20 firms. In this case, each firm still has market power, but they face competition. In this case, firms have incentives to cooperate. It is called collusion, or firms can collude. They can communicate with each other and decide on a price. For instance, they could charge the monopoly price. They could all charge the same price and share the profits made. Sometimes collusion is not even explicit. Sometimes firms look at each other on the market and follow each other's behavior without even explicitly communicating. It is illegal and firms are subject to huge fines if they're caught. And here are a couple of examples that I strongly suggest you to look at by clicking on the links. In Europe, in the European Union, uh, two or three firms in the gas industry were accused of colluding. They were charging the same prices across countries. The European uh, competition, competition, um, competition Policy Commission filed a case and uh, provided evidence that those firms were uh, were cooperating one way or another and they got subject to a huge fine. Even in the shrimp market, some fishermen were aligning their own prices, which were way above the competitive price, trying to increase their profits. In Europe, between Switzerland, France and Germany, there was a case with car glass, so the glass that is being used to make um, windshields and windows. And there are two more examples there taken from um, one from Wikipedia and one from another website. It's a fascinating topic and um, public authorities hire economists to work on mergers, competition, monopolies and so on on a regular basis. They monitor each market and see if the market is competitive enough, see if uh, the price is too high or if there is any way to uh, improve consumer surplus. When two firms want to merge, they need to ask authorization from the authorities because the authorities might judge that if the merger leads to a monopoly or close to a monopoly, they might uh, reject the, the merger. It's a very interesting topic that you might um, go through in uh, other courses like Econ 325. For now, this lecture is over. Have a good rest of your week and um, see you in the next one. Bye.